On today's show, the supervillain of Venom is revealed, and it is Lady Gaga fans. Gambit has a storyline update, and once again, Christian Bale is being a dick on set. Movie talk starts <laughs> right now. Nailed that one, Chief. Uh, Nailed hey, that every one. Every once in a while, I show the kids I still have a fastball. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk. Over there is John Roca, and this is host producer extraordinaire Kim Horcher. Thank you so much for making your debut on Movie Talk. Yeah. This I is... didn't realize. No, I didn't. Yeah, I feel like I've been here before. You, I feel like you have been here before, too. It's a very similar desk. It's used for many things around here. Probably seen Kim on Jedi Council, on Nerd Alert, on a ton of other things, online, television related, or you know John Roca's voice from Transformers. Whole lot of stuff to get to today, but before we get to that, I want to remind you guys, this Friday in New York City. I'm going to be doing a stand-up show at New York Comedy Club, October 5th, 8 p.m. at New York Comedy Club in the East Village. It's a new location. You can get tickets at MarkLSlive.com. Use the promo code SCHMOES. They're kind of going quick, so make sure you guys grab tickets today or else they might get sold out. With all that out of the way, whole lot of movie news to get to. And Kim, I was not made aware of this prior to going on camera, but apparently you get a little scared watching horror movies. Yeah. So I'm not sure if this first story is going to resonate I, I with you. I couldn't handle of the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland until like three years ago. <laughs> she finally Yikes. wrote the Haunted Mansion. It's a lot. Roka, so <laughs> yeah. the news of The Conjuring switching directors, James Wan obviously did the first two, yeah. and now that's going to be changing hands. Can you convince Kim as to why she should watch The Conjuring movies? Because I know you're oh, kind yeah. of a Brady cat as well. Yeah, they're scary, but they're not scary in the same way because this relationship between Patrick Wilson and Vera Farmiga is the reason to watch these, this, these movies, their connection, their conversations as they negotiate the stuff. And there are some jump scares, but it's more like religious scares, more like even you know hell and heaven and hell, heaven and hell. Are you saying kind of stuff? that I would need to be religious to be scared of this? No, no, I would say I would say that you don't need to be religious at all. Therefore, it won't scare you as much. That's okay. what I'm saying. Because I sense that maybe you're not as religious as I am. So. Oh, we, we've hung out before, and yeah. you know this to be true. <laughs> yeah, see, so you know, it, it won't maybe it won't scare you as deeply as it scares those see, of us who I'm actually believe. I'm only agnostic when it comes to like going to church and like actually having to give effort. But when something's trying to scare me religiously, yeah. it's going to achieve the mission. In the first two Conjuring movies, the first one more so than the second one, I thought were great horror. Uh, they, they were a lot of fun, but also very scary. And so mm. Michael Chavez is going to be taking over for James Wan. And Michael Chavez has a movie coming out under the New Line banner early next year. He also had a short. That's how James Wan and Wan's production company, Atomic Monster, first found him. And this is the kind of story that you like hearing because this is James Wan, a guy who has been known to pluck directors out of obscurity. They make short films, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, they're making big-time motion pictures. David F. Sandberg, another example. Now he's doing a DC movie. So I like the way that we're looking at horror films where if you can tell a good story, doesn't matter if it's in a short on YouTube, it can transfer into a 90-minute, two-hour movie. Kim, do you like the call of James Wan? Basically, saying, look, I love these movies. I started this universe. It's time for somebody else to take the reins. It's like someone using their power for good for once <laughs> instead of, you know, <laughs> let's just get, let's shovel more money on my pile for me to eat and wet my butt with. But it's just like, I, I like this. I like someone who pays it forward and it looks like he's doing it. We all know who James Wan is mm. and we all, you know, even if you are scared of things or startled easily, <laughs> you know he's a good director. Yeah, Roka, do you see Wan as becoming one of these directors that is going to continue to care about the movies that mm -hmm. he's producing or do you see him becoming a guy that's like it's going to be less and less hands on to the point where it's just yeah we can slap my name on this as an executive producer because I don't see him in that I still see him as a guy who really cares about everything that his name is stamped on regardless in what role he's working I agree and I, and I think this just makes more sense overall because he's starting to move out of that just director realm and into more of a I don't know more of an executive realm being executive producer of these films being in charge of these situations he's got the Aquaman movie coming coming out. Like Kim said, why not pay for it? Let a young kid come in and do see what they can do with it. And eventually you have to let go of the baby that started you and let it grow on its own and let it be, let somebody, you, know, you got to put it on to school and let it be taught by another adult. And those are the things that happen. And so I like that he's doing this. And this makes me excited for La Llorana, which is the one that Chavez directed. It's coming out next, uh, next week, next year, rather. I'm looking forward to seeing that one. And it isn't like he doesn't have the golden touch. The Nun made how much? These Conjuring films do. And you got the skinny one coming out soon. 
Luna. I can't remember the name of that one. That's probably going to do some money too. So he obviously knows what he's doing here. And I think the smartest thing for him is the natural progression, the natural order thing is to move a little bit out and start seeing the bigger picture. And so now he's in charge of an entire empire as opposed to just one franchise. And I think that's a smart move by him. And people seem to trust him with this kind of thing. They handed him Aquaman in that way as well. So That's right. Well, Chavez's movie comes out in April of 2019. Yeah. But we got movies coming out this week, and that would be Venom and A Star is Born. And finally, it gets revealed the real reason why Bradley Cooper, the director of A Star is Born, cast Lady Gaga. Not because she's super talented, she's an incredible musician, or because he thought she had some acting chops. It's because her fan base is going to go crazy <laughs> against whatever other movie is coming out that weekend. There's been reports that some of the negativity throwing around Venom might be from accounts generated from Lady Gaga's fan base because they do not want Lady Gaga's movie, A Star is Born, to come in second at the box office. They want that movie to be the most talked about film this weekend and not Venom. Currently, Venom is tracking around 55 to $60 million, unless you believe me, who says it ain't making more than $30 million. And A Star is Born is tracking around 25 mil. And I'm just going to say this to all the Lady Gaga fans out there. I appreciate the effort. You really got to manage your time better because you didn't have to do this for Venom. Okay, <laughs> I saw Venom. It's going to get enough bit negative publicity on its own. You can save your breath. It's going to take care of itself. But this is one of these things that we deal with now, regardless of what movie it's coming out. Sometimes we see this when it's a Marvel versus DC, negative attacks over there, or if it's a Star Wars movie. Anytime you have a film like this, there's going to be conflict. And now that it's been mobilized, Kim, what do you make of all of this hubbub? Is, is this much to do about though? nothing? Because we, I remember when we had those, uh, like, alleged, you know, the fan, the Warner Brothers is being is being tricked by this army of people that were paid by Marvel to give them bad mm. reviews and it, you know that was nonsense that did not happen it was a lot of fans being mad at other fans or trying to shift the blame or what have you i i read some of the reviews for this movie i think it's going to do its own job of not getting people in theaters <laughs> all by itself but you know it might be fun for those of us who like uh, Jim Carrey as comedic dancing, following a lobster tank, uh, fun stuff like that. There's some good fun to be had with Venom, <laughs> but I will say this, bro. Okay, it ain't yeah. a Star Is Born because I've seen a Star Is Born too, and it is fan. Fantastic. I think it's one yeah. of the best movies of the year. It's a shoe and to get nominated for Best Picture of the Year, along with whatever other acting, directing, music awards you might have. Yeah. So I don't think this is a huge thing. I don't think this is like, I, I, first of all, I don't blame Lady Gaga at all. It's not her saying no, to her no. fans, hey, minions, attack. This is just some people who really love Lady Gaga to the point where they're going to crap on another movie. Is this a big deal to you? I don't think it's a big deal, but I think it's an indication of where we're going as a society uh, overall, maybe not just America, but like overall in the world, because obviously social media it touches so many people and makes it connects people from all over the world different countries and what have you but we're seeing that people are able to use this social media to mobilize a, a large legions of people to do certain things influencers is something that's happened over the last few years those kind of people you know people put their products with these influencers because they think they can get an effect so these people now are taking control of it the little monsters or what I think that's what her name for her fan base is they have always been in support of Lady Gaga from the beginning they love her to pieces so they're willing to do this extra work for her and it's their way of showing support for her it's their way of trying to influence the conversation about both of these movies and why not if it's a free society and you're smart enough to mobilize these people and use a social media uh, social media app to do this then why not do it I don't think it's a negative you can't have one without the other you can't control something that, that was created for a certain thing and then now it's being used in a certain way it's gotta be it's you gotta a little let it disingenuous be. though to do that I think I think it's not, I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to tell anybody what to tweet or what not to tweet, but no. I'm going to tell everybody out there is that, and I've said this before, before all this crap came out, like, just do your own legwork as far as whether you want to go see a movie or not. Don't look at a few tweets and say, oh, now I've made my decision. You can trust movie reviewers. Mm -hmm. You can trust the tomato meter. You can look at trailers. You can do all your due diligence, but just, I think that, Kim, this shows that we have to figure out how we disseminate information and be a little smarter about it than just believing any sort of tweet and hashtag that comes along. I don't know. I'm kind of psyched by the Venom reviews. Can I ask you a question? You certainly can. As you have not seen the film No, yet? I haven't. I'm here for you. Do Venom and the symbiote kiss? Um, there's there's a lot of... Wait, Venom and the symbiote <laughs> are the same person. Yeah, <laughs> but then they kiss, right? That's what I heard. No. There's, um, th th there's a lot oh, of making out. There there's is a kiss. A lot of, th there's yes, a lot there of is. tongue. 
in this movie? Not since there Kiss was a lot of tongue. the Philadelphia Forum in 77. Has there been this much tongue, this yeah. much fire, oh, it's all over this Tumblr. much blood? Yeah, it's, um, th- I, th- <laughs> does that kind of stuff, just taking this a little bit differently though, yeah. does that kind of stuff, like, like Chris, we're joking about whether you see Venom making out or all this stuff, does that in a way help interest in Venom? Because nobody's saying this movie's great, but right. they're saying it's, it, it's either fun or it's so bad it's good kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Does that, in I'm the way, kind of person who likes to watch how did this get made movies. Right. So if it's awful, I will watch it for funsies. Okay, yeah. Roka, do you see Venom as being that or did you just see Venom as being eh? No, I think um, what I'm seeing online from a number of people, and including my own uh, you know, Schmodown tag team partner, Dan Murrow, he liked the film. He was very vocal about this on social media, how much he liked it. Perry Nemiroff said there's a lot to enjoy in the film, although, a lot, and then a lot not to enjoy in the film. So this is what it comes down to is what kind of film is this? And it feels like it's that kind of film where it's so bad, it's good for a lot of people. Coy said this on our spoiler review, which we'll talk about, in, which we'll, I think we dropped tomorrow night. He said to him, it reminded him of the best part of 90s superhero films. For me, I don't agree. I think it's a terrible movie, but there are some enjoyable moments. So if you if you want to turn your brain off about world building and character development, and if you don't mind cliches and tropes, then go and watch this movie. You're gonna have a good time because Tom Hardy and Venom are actually the reason to watch this movie. They're enjoyable. Once the pairing fully kicks in, they're enjoyable to watch. But you got to really turn your brain off about so many other things in this film. I've gotten Maybe. over the idea of this being a, a faithful Venom movie. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's not even close. <laughs> it's not even close. It's not even close. And so that's what I would say. That's my overall feeling about it. And I think that is right. People, some people, The humor, for some people, it clicks and they enjoy it. For other people, they don't get, grab onto it at all. Well, there you have it. So uh, if you want some laughs that are intentional and some that are unintentional, check out Venom. Turn your brain off, but don't turn your phone off because the president might be texting you. <laughs> Move on to the next story. That would be Simon Kin. Kinberg is talking more about the X-Men universe, but not about X-Men Dark Phoenix or even New Mutants. Nope, we're talking Gambit. That's right. He said that Gambit has evolved since its original iteration. And let's be honest, who the hell knows what's happening with Gambit, when it's going to be released, who's going to be playing Gambit. All those questions are still up in the air. But what he has told us is that the story has evolved from a heist film into more of a love story. So you have Gambit, you have Bella. There's going to be the love story is going to be the center focus. There's also going to be heist elements and hell, Gambit. It's a mutant, so I'm sure there's going to be some sort of action in there, too. Uh, Roka, mm. the quote that Kinberg had says that there are elements that are similar yeah. to what they originally had with the script, but because it's been through so many iterations, it's a different tone, almost in a subgenre. One of the things that they've done with these standalone movies is that it still has elements of a heist movie. Mm-hmm. It has elements of a romantic comedy and a heist movie because he's a thief, but it's a love story between him and Bella. Is that the way that you want your gambit? Well, I don't know if it's the way that I want my gambit, but I understand the logic of going this route because Bella and Gambit have known each other since they were kids. So there's a, if you're gonna do an origin story with this character, you gotta go all the way back to the beginning and she is the one character that had been in his life consistently since he was a child and what they end up becoming, you know, in the couple and then what happens to her after they couple and the switching of sides that happens throughout this. It's almost like a Romeo and Juliet type of vibe to this relationship. So there's that's very interesting to explore. I think they realize that these superhero films now have to come out with a little more weight to them. Uh, you see the Venom I would have never thought Michelle Williams would be in a film like this. But she took this and she was like, it was nice to just kind of relax and have fun and not have to bring all this like emotional baggage to this character. And so you're going to find these actors who want to go and have to try that hard because the writing's just not that good. Basically, not to have to do Blue Valentine, put myself through that. God, that movie. That movie. That'll that'll wreck you. You talk about a horror movie. Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely Mm. horrible. So I I see this and so this makes sense to me and this is going to add to the element of, and it makes sense because you're hitting the same. um, n- notes that you hit with Deadpool. Deadpool worked because of that romance between Ryan Reynolds and Rena Baccarin's character. Those two are the reason that movie really works for me. Yeah, the jokes and blah, 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 but it's that heart. The heart is this f- f- fantastic romance between these two. If you d- develop that with uh, LeBeau, who's always unlucky in love, then it really cements him as an under- underdog character and you want to watch him. Yeah, Kim, what's your read on this as far as the Gambit movie goes? Do you like the love story being the primary focus now? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> Roke and I were texting about this. Yeah. And my re- response to him was, that's not Rogue. And I <laughs> it's was... It's not Rogue. Because 
I think they're the best couple in all of comics. I think their story is tragic and tense and sexy, but it's also like this would be if I were to watch a movie about my boyfriend's last mm-hmm. girlfriend before me, which is I don't care. <laughs> I don't need to see this. Get it out of my face. Bring me the real deal. Wait, did you hate Gwen Stacy in Amazing Spider-Man 2 as well? Did you hate I didn't that? like Amazing Spider-Man 2. But is it was it because of Gwen Stacy? No. <laughs> but you enjoyed that relationship and that's the one before Mary Jane Watson. I guess. I think I've chosen my ship. Fair enough. And I, I will that. not not abandon it. Yeah. I guess I'm I'm one of those Twitter stands. Well, they may Bella may pass away, and so that opens the door. I don't for the want rogue. her to be dead. I just don't care about Fair her. Fair enough. I just think that uh, in in no world do I think that the the love story in Deadpool is why Deadpool's a great movie. Uh, I think it's nice. I think it's a very nice, sweet thing to oh. see, and it's nice to help ground the character. I didn't Deadpool's love the fridging. Great. Because what I said, I didn't love the fridging in I, Deadpool too. I I just that's fair. I I loved the action. Mm-hmm. I loved the jokes. I love how quick it was. I love Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool and the fact they have a nice relationship. Icing on the cake, but it ain't the cake. I don't mind if this is a cake for Venom because I don't know that storyline as well. As long as we get elements of a heist movie and we get some sort of, I just want to see a good movie. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, this Gambit thing has been talked about for so long. The fear is is that it's going to become something like a Venom, where yeah. you hear that oh, this could happen for a long time then it finally does and it's not really what we wanted. Is that y'all's read on Gambit right now though? I mean, are we too this, far down this road? Is this movie ever going to truly happen? I Cuz I feel know. like yeah. I've been talking it for all of my adult life. Well, it yeah. seems like it seems like it was like 30 years ago when Channing Tatum took that that yeah. selfie. Yeah. He's know? still involved. Yeah. And, but Simon Kinberg said it. I, I would encourage Simon Kimberg to not be so uh, provincial in his conversation, saying, "Oh well, I'm Jewish. Uh, you know, I won't believe it until I see it on the screen." We're all Jewish, Kimberg. None of us want to believe it's going to happen until we see it on the screen. None of it because it's been taking <laughs> so long to actually get up on the screen. So I would just say that I, I won't believe a thing until I actually see it on the screen. Not even start a production. I mm-hmm. have to see it actually being on a screen at a press screening or whatever. Then I'll believe it's actually happening, and only then. All right, you didn't convert to Judaism just there, just for the joke. We did you? all did. <laughs> Rokeberg, let's now do this. We got Hanukkah and Christmas. It's going to be a good <laughs> December for everyone. Well, I want to remind you guys that up on the channel now is an all new episode of Collider Heroes. You can also check out the Schmodown match that dropped yesterday. Anarchy continues, and the Collider Games team, uh, in corroboration with Showtime and Festival of Disruption, they're previewing the Twin Peaks VR. That's a cool thing. You had any insight into the Twin Peaks? I've seen it. Reality? I've seen it. Well, look, I'm not a VR guy. So, but I've heard, but I sitting next to Josh McCoug, I hear all of it through osmosis and uh, people walking around. But I know there's something we're really proud of, and uh, I can't wait to be involved in this or, or try it out and see what it's like. Well, something that I know Kim Horcher cannot wait to see is the Lilo and Stitch live action Hello. movie. Yeah, yeah. It just got greenlit. It's Disney. It's going to be a live action CG hybrid, obviously, because you got Lilo and Stitch. It's a, uh, you know, the, the Hawaiian centric animated movie that was a hit in the early 2000s. It's not going to be back in the version that they, I, I don't want to say the name Smurfs, but that's kind of how they did it with the first two Smurfs movie. It's also how they do it with Sonic the Hedgehog, which I think could just work. Just because there's a blue thing doesn't mean it's Smurfs or <laughs> Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> Is this the right way to bring Lilo and Stitch back to the forefront from a big fan well, of the original? I- I mean, that begs the question, do any of these live-action Disney remakes need to exist? And the answer is probably no, but we <laughs> like them. They just I make so much money. the main problem is Ali Cravalho is too old to play Lilo and too young to play Nani, <laughs> so where are we going to put her, folks? <laughs> She'd be like the cool aunt, you know? Yeah, I, no, because they're dead. That's, that's, a, that's a plot point in the movie. I should probably see the movie. Yeah. You haven't seen it? I, I, I saw it once and I fell asleep, I think. You didn't cry your eyes out and I be like, cry. they're a family. Not at Lilo and Stitch. <laughs> <laughs> did I miss this, Roka? Was this Ohana. On? It was fun. I remember seeing it at the El Capitan, but I have friends who were in animation, so they dragged me to these things and I go see them. But I did enjoy this one because uh, Stitch has an Elvis obsession, which is great, which I enjoy watching. And obviously it was successful because it spawned a bunch of direct-to-DVD oh sequels God, and so a TV many. series. So, I mean, this is a pretty... B- and this came out when Disney was... Was not doing so well with their animation, so it's something they're really proud of. We'll see what they create of it. I like that the people from Aladdin are doing it because they already. They, I mean, when you, if you can transfer Aladdin onto a big screen live action, that's an incredible task. So for them to be able to do this with Lilo and Stitch, I think is interesting. The writer though is a horror writer, so 
What angles are we going to play this up as? Listen, there's death. There's yeah, there is. Abdu child abduction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they threaten to kill Stitch <laughs> all the time. Have there you are seen suits. Stitch? Yeah, Stitch is a. He's, he's adorable. A, yeah, yeah. In a certain point of view, <laughs> you know? He's kind of scary. Yeah. I, Those I like razor him. sharp teeth. I think he's pretty cute. But if you have Stitch and you have Lilo mm -hmm. and you have them in a new movie that's exclusively on the Disney streaming service, which is what this is intended for, so mm -hmm. may not see the light of day in theaters, but that's what they're doing with the Lady and the Tramp mm -hmm. movie. That's what they're probably going to be doing with the Star Wars live action show as well. Right. So, Kim, do they already have your money, the Disney streaming service, when it comes out in 2019? I or is this the kind of thing that sells you on it? Listen, there's so much on there. Yeah, they've already got me. I'm so reluctant to... Um, I don't trust corporations just naturally, but <laughs> I really like it, and I think I'm buying into it. Because they, look, they own everything, and that's bad. But they own everything, and that's great! <laughs> huh? Just don't trust the corporations that Disney owns, but you can trust Disney, because no. they're the corporations I'm that own I'm so very conflicted much. about it. It's a, it's a tough thing, but, but this is a smart move, because you know you're getting older in life when the things that they're now making live action at Disney are the things that you're not even nostalgic for anymore because you were too old to really go see that movie. Yeah. And Leo and Stitch came out in 2002, so you know I'm already kind of not caring about Disney movies. I'm in that time of my life. I'm trying to figure out what the hell to do with my life, so I never saw Lilo and Stitch, and now it's coming out on the Disney streaming service, but there is clearly a market for this. There's clearly generations of fans that want to see stuff like this, mm -hmm. and and if, for no other reason, if you're a parent, you want the Disney streaming service because they're making all this content mm -hmm. that's exclusive that you don't want your kids to hear about from somebody else at school. You just want to sit them in front of the TV, then they can watch, and you can go off and do whatever you want because the kids are going to be zombies staring at Lilo and Stitch. Wow. Yeah. That's a strong uh, statement. Yeah. That's not how I read it, but okay. <laughs> kids enjoy this stuff. It's a fun <laughs> escape from also, their Also, adults lives. like it. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, no, I mean, I, I, I fully acknowledge <laughs> that there's stuff. Every time I get into a Disney live action movie, I'm like, all right. And then 10 minutes in, swept up. Jungle Book was great. Sleep. Beauty and the Beast was great. Sleep, uh, Cinderella, I was, great. Cinderella, I was really surprised how much I enjoyed it. I went in like this to Cinderella. And then I, by the end, I was thoroughly enjoying it. I, I, you know, it's not a story that gravitates to me, but the, but the way they did it was great. What's the, what's the live action Disney movie you're most excited about? Mulan. Coming up, Mulan. Ooh, yeah. However, they did cut out Lee Shang and yep. all the songs, so they will never get down to business or defeat the Huns. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. Strong and that's, that's hard to take in. That's a hard thing to process. <laughs> Roka, is uh, Mulan your pick as well? I don't know how I follow that. Oh, no, for me, it's Aladdin. I absolutely love Aladdin. It's like my number one favorite film. Is that uh, one of coming to live action? Yep, live action. I didn't know Will, that. Will, Will Smith is doing the voice of uh, Oh, that's the right. Genie. I did yeah. know that. Mm -hmm. Guy Ritchie's directing it, which was an interesting choice. That one is great because so. it's a it's one of the more action oriented mm -hmm. Disney movies. Mm -hmm. So that actually would be a huge feat. And to I make like it that a live love action. story, Mark Ellis. It's fun. I don't hate love stories. I feel like you do. I mean, I might. What have you just, got against a whole new world? Yeah. I, uh, a Whole New World's a good Disney song. I can, can you feel the love tonight? No. It's better than I can you feel. I, I am not a Lion King guy. I am definitely an Aladdin guy. I'm not a Lion King guy. Any song that gets lions to sleep with each other in a Disney oh, movie. Boy. That face Nala makes in the song yeah. is hard to get over. She's oh, giving him enough. hungry eyes to quote Dirty <laughs> Dancing. Yeah. Well, before it gets any dirtier talking about the <laughs> Disney streaming service, let's move on to Netflix. Netflix is in the process of greenlighting a new Chronicles of Narnia series. Get ready, Narnia fans are going to develop a series and films. It's, so it's, it's a series and it's other movies that are based on C.S. Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. So The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe has seen a few other incarnations. Obviously, we had the recent run of movies in theaters. Netflix's chief content officer, Ted Sarando, said of the news that the beloved Chronicles of Narnia stories have resonated with generations of readers around the world. Families have fallen in love with characters like Aslan and the entire world of Narnia, and we're thrilled to be their home for years to come. John Roca, yeah. Netflix, Ooh. Narnia, Ooh. good combination. The yeah, chronic Cause. what? Calls of Narnia. The chronic what? Um, let me tell you something. We didn't I, rehearse this. I'm it, sorry. I'm sorry. We, we, we had better <laughs> rhythm off camera. Don't worry. Uh, it's just a dress rehearsal. Oh, good, good. No one's hearing this. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I grew up with these books. Like my, my, We didn't have a lot of money in my house. My dad, mom, they worked hard, but there wasn't a lot of money coming in. And sometimes uh, my dad, he was a house painter. He would get paid in books. We got Encyclopedia Britannica so he could educate his kids in this way outside of the school. One of the big things that I got was the whole collection of the Chronicles, 
seven books, The Chronicles of Narnia in paperback. And when I would go to work with my dad in the summers, uh, house painting for, uh, it was 14, 15, 16, I would reread those books over and over and over again during breaks or on the drive there, or on the drive back from wherever we were working. And so to me, I have a special, special place in my heart for the Chronicles of Narnia. I saw all these in the movie theater that they came out, regardless of quality. I had to see what they were like. I love the TV series from 1979. That's a great TV series that went into that, that did their, their animated version of it. So to see that this is coming again on Netflix, I am super excited about it. Because Netflix now, do, do, I think this is their way of competing with Amazon and Lord of the Rings stuff. Stuff, right, so they want to have their side of the. They want to have their piece of the pie, and there's a lot to explore here if they actually go through all seven of the novels. So I'm excited by it, and I trust Netflix with all. I, you know, eight billion dollars is really taking them a long way this year. All right, Roca is looking at Netflix like they are, in fact, the Jesus line. Kim, do you <laughs> look at the Chronicles of Narnia in the same retrospective, fond, nostalgic light that John Roca does? Did you and and your parents ever work together while reading Narnia? You know the answer I'm going to give. <laughs> I mean, that was a very sweet story, Roca. It warms my heart, and it makes me feel like a true asshole for saying, <laughs> I don't need to see this. I was also given these books as a child, yep. and I was forced to read them. Oh, forced. And they, yes, and they all got, the first one was good, the second one was negligible, the third one was boring, and the fourth through seventh, just, it's too, it's too boring. It's too boring. I don't like that they punished Susan at the end, but that's mm. just my reason. They punished her for being an adult woman. Mm. And they were like, that bitch, blah, blah, blah. But it's not, what, she, she can't up? help it that she grew up or she chose not to be in, you oh, know, yeah. a child forever mentally. Yeah, she didn't want to go back, yeah. Yeah, it's right. like when all those kids give, uh, give Robin Williams shit for growing up in, um, in uh, Hook? The Hook. Yeah. It's not his fault. He, he's, he's got a family. He's got yeah. to provide for him. What do you yeah. want him to do? Yeah, yeah. lost boys. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm not Team Rufio then. But <laughs> I just, I, I mean, the movies were as you said, mm -hmm. of questionable quality, despite having Tilda Swinton as the... And James McAvoy. Yeah. As Tumnus, Mr. And Tumnus. Ben Barnes. And Ben Barnes, yeah. As Prince Caspian. That's right. I, I'm just not interested in it, but then I also recognize it's not necessarily for me. Mm. This could be great for parents to share with their children. Perhaps the execution will be better than I remember mm -hmm. of being bored out of my skull and being forced to read them <laughs> in the third grade. <laughs> you know, maybe that's part of it being forced to read something you don't want to read. Were you forced to read the Lord of the Rings books? No. Did you read them? Yeah. Okay. So, I, think it, I think we're seeing more <laughs> that it's really through the looking glass of how you read them. If you wanted to take a break from, from hot, uh, <laughs> intense manual labor, like painting houses, you just want to get a break and read a book, you can escape to another world. But if you're like him and you'd rather go do something else and you have to sit in this room and read, you may not have fond memories. And I loved reading too. Yeah. But, you know, maybe it's the religion thing again, which it is, is it, I'm not very religious. It does have I hate undercurrent. being made to do anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, probably it's fine, and I'm the crazy one. I'm willing to accept this. I'm going to send you a gift of these books and say, read these whenever you feel like it. No <laughs> pressure at all. If you get around, let me know whenever you uh -huh. get them. Maybe you'll read them and have a more relaxed, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe I'll just send them back to you. <laughs> Return to sender. <laughs> well, I'll tell you where you're not going to send them, right here, because you guys know I'm not a big reader. I'm never going to read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I'm not going to read it to myself or my kids, because they're never going to exist. What I will do is check this out on Netflix, because I am excited about the re I like the movies. Yeah. Even, I, I didn't see the Voyage of the Dawn Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Treader. Okay. I like the little mouse. Yeah. a lot of pressure to Reek put on a cheap. kid. You walk through a painting, and then all of a sudden, you're just trying to get out of school. Now you got to save an entire world. But it's, it's a lot to put on some kid's shoulders. This really but. feels like a catalyst for us to complain about things that we don't like, <laughs> such as the convention of having children or being a child and being forced to do things you don't want to do. There we go. I am sorry, C.S. Lewis. I'm sure you have a beautiful series. C.S. Lewis, you knocked it out of the park, and now Netflix <laughs> is going to take the ball and run with it from here. Well, like Kim said, we don't want to keep talking about things we don't like. So let's talk about Dick Cheney. Before we get there, <laughs> we are going to save some time for your live Twitter questions. Go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. Use the hashtag Collider Movie Talk. You can ask us about anything that we talked about here today. Anything else that's on your mind in the world of entertainment? Did you read the Chronicles of Narnia books? Were you forced to read them? Or did you read them out of your own volition? Let us know how that turned out. Did you get free Pizza Hut pizza on Tuesdays as a result of the Great Book It program? The only thing that ever got me to read. Well, let's move on to that Dick Cheney trailer. Christian Bale is playing Dick Cheney in the new movie Vice. The movie opens on Christmas, directed by Adam McKay, and it also stars Sam Rockwell as George W. Bush, Steve Carell as Donald Rumsfeld, and Amy Adams as Dick Cheney's wife, Lynn. This, whew, 
I, you know, I, you, you, we saw images before, and it was like, wow, Christian Bale looks a lot like Dick Cheney, and Steve Crow looks a lot like Rumsfeld. The person that stole this trailer from me was Sam Rockwell as George W. Bush, <laughs> but that takes nothing away from Bale as Cheney, from Amy Adams as his wife, from Carell, because they all look like they're committing to this role. And, Kim, we were watching the trailer right before we went to air. Adam McKay is directing it. There's people with comedic chops in this movie for sure, but I thought it did a nice job of having a wink and a nod tone, but not getting to the point where it felt like an SNL sketch. How did you view the trailer? I felt it was a little SNL sketchy, but in a great way. And, you know, a classic sketch like David as Pumpkins or um, <laughs> Matt the Radar Guy, like one that I'm going to watch over and over again. I, I, Yes, we do have two alumni from The Office uh, directly mentioned in the trailer. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, we're in this time period now where we look at George W. Bush as, you know, being kind of a, a cute drunk guy at a funeral eating candy. But in the <laughs> day, we maybe we felt a little bit differently. Maybe this is pulling me back to 2011 and how I felt about um, military industrial complexes and uh, corporatization of America. And I'm ready to go back. I wasn't sure I was on board with this before, but... I'm in now. Yeah, Roka, Kim, mm. Kim's kind of hinting at the time period that this that the events are based on, yeah. and then also the fact that we do have over a decade now to look back on it. Look at where we are now as oh, a I society. Oh, I said 2011. I'm sorry. Well, it's close enough. Yeah. 2007. 2007, <laughs> and then Obama got elected in 2008. But it's like before that, this yeah. is what uh, this is what life was like. But a lot of that stuff was behind the curtain. Mm-hmm. So now. As tends to happen, once people are no longer in power, things start to come out, stories start to come out, people start talking, and you get movies like this. Do you want to see movies like this? Well, I'm a political junkie, so to me, yes, this looks fantastic. But I'm of two minds. One mind is like, this looks incredible. Adam McKay following up the big short with something like this is really uh, just incredible. See, this guy who was a former SNL writer now creating these kinds of movies that are commenting on a certain times in our world and very and commenting on them very honestly and realistically with seeing the costs uh, uh, that we had to pay for that. And so he did that with a big short. You see this happening in Vice. And I love Christian Bale. It's like he disappears into the diction. The mannerisms, it's unsettling. Uh, Carell as an older Rumsfeld is unsettling in how he looks like him. And you're right, Rockwell is, in, uh, is fantastic as uh, uh, um, uh, George W. Bush. And just the, the holding of that chicken leg, the half-eaten chicken leg, just staring at him. <laughs> we going to do right. this thing? It, it's, it's even better than what uh, uh, Josh Brolin, I felt, did in W. I feel this is even more authentic to what George Bush is probably like. Now, the other side of me who hates Cheney, hates everything he did, hates the terrible stuff he put forward and the, and the lives that, were co- that, that he cost and the money that was taken and the corruption that I thought went on during that administration under his watch, um, I, I hate that this trailer makes him look cool, makes it look fun, and makes it look like this is going to be an awesome exploration of a dude who's a badass who flouted the rules and at the end got away with it. That really frustrates you think me. That's, what, this movie I, I looks that's like. what it feels like to me as I'm watching it because the music is awesome. He is so badass when he's walking slowly down the hall. All of it makes him look like Jordan Belfort in Wolf of Wall Street. That's where DiCaprio I side did. with Kendo where, where, where I think that all of that is pomp and circumstance and, and it's more of a mocking tone is how I read it. More I, like I didn't sense sketch. that at all. I thought it yeah. was making him look like a villain when he was coming down the stairs yeah, and but a bad like, changed American as history. To a mean, as opposed to a Jerk. I can see, but I, I do wonder how people are going to interpret that depending on what your political exactly. leanings are, because yeah, that's yeah, a great yeah. point. There's been characters in history that should be categorized as villains. Jordan Belfort, uh, Gordon yeah. Gecko, Gecko, where but people wanted to be them. Michael and, Corleone. Yeah, and, and it's like, wait, 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 you guys know this isn't actually... Yeah. Oh, people love the Sith. They mm-hmm. love Darth yeah. Vader. They love Palpatine. I, I don't you know? get that personally, but yeah. yes, that's true. These are, they, these are people <laughs> that you should not aspire to be like. Yes. But... I do wonder if this trailer, if people are going to see that and feel the way that you felt. I'm just surprised to hear you, given your political leanings, yeah, felt like that. But it looked, it looks great. I, I would love to go see this tomorrow. I think our friend Alex uh, saw an early screening of this because he's not a, officially a film critic. You he got know into people, a fan man. Screen. I, you, well, you, it has been leaked this people week. People talk John to me. John Roca knows people in high places. And one day he'll slip and tell you something he's not supposed <laughs> exactly, to tell you. And I'll, so and I'll keep watching, on the folks. Streets. <laughs> will movie critic for food. Um, he, 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 Alex told me, he said, it was phenomenal, the film, to see them all like disappear into the makeup and you forget that it's them within five to ten minutes of the movie. And so that makes me even more excited about it. And once again, 
It's in Adam McKay's hands, and I know his political leanings. We're following him on social media, so I know this isn't going to be something that makes Cheney out to be a hero. But the trailer itself, you're asking me my opinion of the trailer, the trailer, that music is badass music, and they're showing him as a guy who's like taking his time. And he's a, plus, the shots are from below, so it makes him look bigger than he actually is. So uh, that worries me and concerns me a little bit. But yeah, I think it's going him. to paint yeah. him in a way that this man is horrible, and what he's done is irreparable, and it's led this disgusting precedent that has hurt the American people at mm. large. I think it's going to ultimately go that way. You have to have a cool trailer. Yeah, right? I, to get people in the theaters. You're right. You're right. <laughs> it can't be a You're bummer. Right. You're right. <laughs> I mean, we, we got to put, we, what, what do you want him to say? Turn the wind? I mean, we, we, we got <laughs> to put people in the seats. Now, this movie comes out Christmas, and so one would naturally be inclined, given the talent involved, given the way the trailer looks. Mm -hmm. This could be an Oscar contender. Is oh, that yeah. how y'all see this? Is it? Does it look like that level to you just from this trailer? I mean, Christian Bale, he is genuinely menacing mm -hmm. and frightening. And I don't see, Bruce Wayne or his other characters. Yeah. I see Dick Cheney and a very chilling portrait of Dick Cheney. Yeah, and like we said, McKay, McKay, the big short got nominated as well, so it would not surprise me that this gets nominated and maybe him as director as well, but certainly Christian Bale. It's incredible. It's incredible. All right, well, we are about to move on to your live Twitter questions. Before we do that real quick, just want to remind you all that tomorrow on Collider, Jedi Council is going live at 10 a.m. Collider Sportsbook drops tomorrow, and there's going to be a Venom spoiler review that's going to drop tomorrow night. So go see the movie if you want to, or go see A Star is Born, because you can go see that too. And then come on back and check out <laughs> the Venom. Only one. Spoiler. <laughs> there could be only one. There could be only one. <laughs> Who knew Lady Gaga fans were such huge Highlander nerds? I know. But odd crossover. All right. Our first Twitter question is going to come from Brian Knight. And uh, Brian says, which movie is more likely to actually happen? Gambit or The Crow Reboot? Ooh. Ooh. Is it good? Uh, I'd say Gambit. I would say Gambit, too, because that movie isn't cursed. Yeah, and has more studio backing. Uh, yeah. And That's the only reason. But here's, I, I don't know about that because... The Gambit movie, it's clearly just going to keep getting delayed. And there's going to be a nice iteration of a script that evolves from a heist to a love story. All that's going to have to get rescheduled mm -hmm. once Disney fully acquires Fox. Because you have Dark Phoenix coming out, you have New Mutants. And then once it gets under the Kim's favorite corporation, Disney Umbrella. Yeah, then all very sudden, conflicted. Hey, they give me checks every <laughs> two weeks. Thank you, guys. It's, it, you, you do wonder what it's going to do to the shelving of various projects, whether you're going to want to put Gambit back on the slate or just keep delaying it inevitably. So The Crow has all at the time. of the, it, It's had all the opportunity in the world. I'm still going to say Gambit. Yeah? I, I, yeah, I still yeah, say yeah. it's Gambit. Just uh, I, Sorry, I can't believe no. in The Crow reboot. Okay, um, let's do uh, Matthias Polakos next up. He says, who do you think will have more influence in the overall quality of the movie as a producer? Is it Michael Bay on Bumblebee or Steven Spielberg, what he has done on Transformers? Jesus. Um, yeah. Because people are, you know, they, they they knew Steven Spielberg was a producer in the Transformers movies, mm -hmm. so you would hope that would help things. With Michael Bay on Bumblebee, you just hope he's not too hands-on. Yeah, I, I would push back to the question of Matthias, how Matthias phrases the question a little bit and say to him, well, look, Spielberg condoned Michael Bay. He was one of the first people to come out and say he loved Michael Bay's vision for the Transformers movies. He dug my, what Michael Bay was doing. So those are, those are essentially two peas in a pot about how they view these Transformers movies. So... I would say, yes, both are going to have an influence to a degree, but I really think Michael Bay would have slightly more influence than Spielberg because Spielberg has a five million projects. He has 10 remakes he's doing right now currently with West Side Story and all this other stuff he's got going on. And, and so I don't see him being hands-on with this. That being said, I think the I think Michael Bay is only only a little bit closer than Spielberg to it, but not really that much because they really want to move away from him. I think it's just there as name only. Well, I, I certainly felt Michael Bay's presence as a producer on the Ninja Turtles movies. Yes, more than I did Steven Spielberg's influence on the Transformers movies. So, Kim, do you think it's going to be a lot of Bay on Bumblebee? I mean, yeah, this is what he. he well, he doesn't own it, but he owns this. You know, mm -hmm. we know that this is his baby and his evolving project, and. I kind of like the way the question is worded because mm. it's almost as if asking, is this movie going to be good or bad? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you that's know? true. But that's fair. I, I would lean toward Bay as well. I mean, they both are involved with Universal Studios, and I'm wondering who has exerted more control over this tangibly connected project, project under them. 
Well, Michael Bay does have his own street at the Paramount lot, so... I think it might be him. Yeah. Because well, I think Spielberg might be over it at this point, or maybe his creative mind is focusing on something and else. And I don't think Spielberg was ever as creatively yeah. involved in the Transformers movies as Michael Bay It was with Ninja Turtles or with, mm-hmm. uh, with Bumblebee. I still see those trailers, and I, get, I, I do get excited for that movie. Yeah. Uh, but I also see... Uh, go ahead. Sorry, Mark. I'm just saying because I've been excited for every Transformers yeah. movie that's come out and I've seen them and I've been sadly uh, brought to, back to reality. But I do think this Bumblebee movie is going to be bad. There are a couple of Bayisms in that trailer too with a, a, a glut of Transformers and Autobots uh, yeah. in that. And then also that last shot of them fighting each other as Haley is running away from them, that's a Bay shot. He's used that numerous times in all his uh, Transformers movies. And so I push back a little bit to, to the question and say, that, yeah, Bay seems like he's the one that has a little more influence still. Okay, Which well, scare next people. question comes from uh, Satyendra Banerjee, and he asks, in the wake of the Vice trailer, what's your favorite movie about a president? Ooh. His is Steven Spielberg's Lincoln, which um, definitely, definitely a contender for me. Mr. Banerjee. What about that one where Abraham Lincoln kills all the zombies? Um, based on the true story, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Abraham yeah. Lincoln, yeah, 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 yeah. Vampire. Thomas sorry, Jefferson was the. The was zombie it, killer? Was Washington the zombie killer? Was Jefferson? I want the zombie killer one. No, it was Lincoln. It was Lincoln. No, Lincoln killed the vampire. Oh, vampire, yeah. right. Tom I Jefferson. mean, that was what was going on under his administration. Right. The big yeah. thing. <laughs> I, I'm going to say FDR killing FDR. all the zombies. Yeah. Took care of a lot of zombies yeah. at FDR. So we're still waiting for that movie. But uh, Abraham Lincoln, Vampire Damn. Hunter. Abraham Lincoln. Roca, you got to... That's tough. And I'm going to put the, the reins on this a little bit, that mm-hmm. it's got to be based on a true president. So it's not right. like the American president right. or Dave. Mm-hmm. It's got to be a real or live real president. Or Independence Day, Bill Paxton. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Bill Pullman was Bill president. Bill Pullman, that's right. He was, but I can't choose him. Yeah. Um, damn, this is a tough question. Um, JFK is what I lean to. I really still enjoy JFK, even though it's not necessarily the life story of the president, but I really enjoy that film. Are you saying about, JF, Oliver Stone's JFK yeah, is 100% accurate? I used to do, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oliver Stone's not, but I, I, look, it's a great performance by Daniel Day-Lewis in Lincoln, but I don't think the movie itself is good. I think he is good. Mm. I, I just think everything around him is not as strong. Uh I don't know. What, are there other choices? Like, are there I can't person? even think of. I mean, very W many. was good. W well, you, was just, good. you have to go by by presidents. So yeah. LBJ's had a couple movies. There was a very interesting oh, one on HBO. Nixon. Yes. Um, Nixon was good. The yeah. Andy Andy not a whole lot of content on Gerald Ford mm-hmm. or Jimmy Carter. Mm-hmm. Reagan still waiting. Right. Uh, George Bush. No. We can keep waiting. Right. Uh, Clinton. There is the Primary Colors movie that was based, like primary based on, on him. kind of based on yep, yep. Emma Thompson resembling Harley Travolta resembling Bill, but not yeah. by name. So right. yeah, it's pretty limited. Then you can go back further into history, and it's not necessarily a movie, but it's a great series. It's a John Adams series oh, yeah. on HBO, which Fantastic. they run every Fourth of July. And I, David Morse is George Washington. You talk about just an opposing badass walking yeah. on there. I didn't yeah. know Morse had that in him. Good stuff. I, I guess I would throw Young Mr. Lincoln in there, 1939 film with Henry Fonda as God. Lincoln. You just got to show off. I know. I mean, it's one of my favorites. It's a Criterion film. It's one of my favorite films. He Henry Fonda does a fantastic job as, as uh, Abraham Lincoln in that film. If only Kim loved the Chronicles of Narnia books like you love the Criterion <laughs> collection. Uh, I liked what Ken Burns did mm. for the Roosevelts. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a great series. Um, but I truly don't think I care for any of them that much. Mm. Pre- presidential movies. I liked Air Force One, and that doesn't count, so I don't know. <laughs> but you President can... Harrison Ford. <laughs> I'll let you write in Harrison Ford on the ballot in 2020. Okay, let's do one more question and call today. This one comes from one of our favorites. J. Scott St. Clair says, if you could choose any anthropomorphic animal character from film to be your companion in life, who would you pick? I'm an ignorant person. What is anthropomorphic? It's like they have human qualities. Ooh. So maybe a talking dog like Air Bud. No, he doesn't talk. He just plays basketball against the rules. No, mm. it's in the rules. I've forgotten it's, Air Bud. I, I think initially there was some pushback against whether a dog can play, but ultimately but then Air they, Bud won. They mm-hmm. found out, you know, by careful dissemination of the clauses. I think I think Air Bud counts as anthropomorphic yeah. just because um, it, it, it can dribble, mm-hmm. you know. Can I say, and this will surprise some people, uh, can I say Caesar from Planet of the Apes? Is he anthropomorphic? Uh, he's the very definition of anthropomorphic. He's uh, talking. I, then I want him because he is a fair-minded leader, and we would get along well in situations, and I have a feeling uh, he could be 
hardcore win he needed to be to get me out of other God, situations. Is there, you can, I would pay you all the money in the world just to have, just to hear him come into the office and complain about this ape that's making me, if Caesar's making me pick up his dry cleaning now, Caesar would totally own you. Dude. Yeah, he would. Caesar would own oh, all absolutely. of us. Yeah. Absolutely. You would become his personal assistant. Well, one of my greatest fears in life. I feel like life, you've sowed our own destruction. <laughs> <laughs> right. One of my greatest fears in life is a simian uprising. So I, he would be like, I would be watching him closely for waiting for signs that he started okay, crawling. Okay, so it's, Roca, against uh, humanity's better judgment, is taking Caesar to be his companion. Kim, you had some time to think about it while uh, Roca was dreaming about a planet of the apes. Falcor. Oh, Falcor's oh, a good one. Oh, yeah. That good could be choice. me going yeah. to the yeah. grocery store. Get around town pretty quick. Never have to worry about the Trader <laughs> Joe's parking lot. Yeah. That's True. a, that's a, Falcor's Wait on the a roof. great pick. I was just thinking like companionship because Falcor's nice, mm -hmm. but your, your place is going to reek like wet dog. Oh, good like, point. It's going to reek. You yeah. say that like he could fit in my apartment. I <laughs> You have to sleep on the roof. <laughs> you have to sleep on the roof. <laughs> Falcor could become your apartment, actually. Um, I'm going to take Paddington. That bear is just oh, look. Oh, nice choice. It, here's a pushback against Paddington: is that you can never own nice things. Luckily, have you seen my apartment? I don't own nice things. I have a TV. I have a recliner. Paddington. As long as you don't mess that up, get marmalade on my nice recliner. We are good. That bear is so <laughs> little and lovable and cute. He gets into little misadventures, but hey, that's the spice of life. Good choice. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Nobody took Winnie the Pooh. No, he's, he's stupid and selfish. I don't want that guy <laughs> in my house. Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh we care about his honey. Oh, forget everyone else. Kim Hortz, put on some pants on the show until the last 10 put seconds. Put on some pants, you ass. <laughs> whoa, whoa, Kim, whoa. <laughs> I, I can also say that I agree with Kim that Winnie the Pooh <laughs> and, and Piglet, I, I, think, I think Tigger has pants. I'm not sure. No, Eeyore, no one has pants. No one has pants. Right. All right. But he wears a shirt with no pants, which is making a statement. It's a free society. What happens in the 100 Acre Wood stays <laughs> yes, it's... in the 100 Acre Wood. Well, that is all the time we have for this episode of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Make sure you leave your comments in YouTube. If you are listening to this on our podcast, please like it, share it, review it, all that good stuff. You can catch us on our podcast forum, Apple Podcast, podcastone.com. I would like to give a hearty thank you to Kim Horcher for joining us here Woo! today. Kim, please come back soon. Yeah. Do not be a stranger. We know you own a flying dog that can talk so <laughs> sure you're yes. literally five minutes away that's accurate john roca yes sir will caesar see you back into the studio or do you have a uh, upkeep for him roca caesar go strong together together strong yeah let's you, do it you say that like he's not gonna kill you or trick you he won't kill me he's a good guy for Koba the would be the issue if i had Koba, then i'd die Mm. No, because he never killed James Franco. He didn't kill Jason uh, Lucas. So, That's true. You know, he didn't. But he didn't. He's, he's a reasonable ape. Don't trust him. Yeah, okay. well, hang out with Roga for a week and let me know how that goes. <laughs> Thank you guys for tuning in. We will see you all tomorrow, 4 p.m. PST as <laughs> usual. Got one more show, and then I'm heading to New York. And I'm at the Comedy Store tonight if you're in Los Angeles. See you all tomorrow. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You wanna watch more? Then click up here, or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.